The Lord be with you. Today we continue the celebration of the season of Pentecost with the fourth Sunday after Pentecost. For our sermon text, it's going to be the Romans 6 passage. As Paul talks about sanctification and what that means and what that looks like. So we'll cover that today. And then we begin in hymn number 750, If Thou But Trust in God to Guide Thee.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, Let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking His grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. For you have delivered my soul from death, Yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. Lord, have mercy, for our eyes have mercy. Lord, have mercy. To God Almighty glory, peace to all the earth. Good will come unto that Jesus' word. We bless and bless you, Father. Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, because your abiding presence always goes with us, keep us aware of your daily mercies, that we may live secure and content in your eternal love. 
through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. What does God say about all these commandments? He says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. What does this mean? God threatens to punish all who break these commandments. Therefore, we should fear his wrath and not do anything against them. But he promises grace and every blessing to all who keep these commandments. Therefore, we should also love and trust in him and gladly do what he commands. Our Old Testament reading comes from Jeremiah chapter 20. O Lord, you have deceived me, and I was deceived. You are stronger than I, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughing stock all the day. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I cry out, I shout, violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. If I say, I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. For I hear many whispering, terror is on every side. Denounce him. Let us denounce him, say all my close friends, watching for my fall. Perhaps he will be deceived. Then we can overcome him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me as a dread warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble. They will not overcome me. They will be greatly shamed for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of hosts, who tests the righteous, who sees the heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance upon them, for to you have I committed my cause. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hand of evildoers. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle is from Romans chapter 6. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms, 
because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness, but what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. We stand for the gospel. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Alleluia, alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, Brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim on the mountaintops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So, everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. This is the gospel of the Lord. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. 
and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, this summer in our summer Sunday school time with families, we're working our way through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and in a couple of weeks we'll be roughly halfway through and we'll hear the Lord say, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. It's a one-liner in the middle of a sermon. A sermon we never get to see the disciples respond to. A sermon we never get to hear Jesus unpack. But it fits perfectly with what the Apostle Paul is talking about here in this text of Romans chapter 6 for us today. Paul is coming off of that wonderful section on being baptized 
into Christ. That just because we're no longer under the curse of the law doesn't mean that we're free to go on sinning however our hearts desire. We have been baptized into Christ, baptized into his death, baptized into his resurrection. We have been rescued from the dominion of sin and we have been made new in Christ Jesus. And so as Paul continues writing, he declares that we are either sins of, slaves of sin or we are slaves of God, one or the other. Slave of sin, slave of God. Just as Christ said, we can't serve two masters. But notice what Jesus didn't say. Jesus didn't say that there are no masters. Jesus didn't say that we are our own masters. This is not mine. For roughly the first 10 months of my existence, this hand and all that it could do belonged to sin. But now, thanks be to God, that this hand and all that it can do, they belong to God. As Paul would write in his letter to Colossa, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. This is the hurdle of Romans 6 for us today. For us who from day one of our lives in this land have grown up being taught that we are free, that we are free to do whatever we want to do, to be whoever we want to be. We're also taught that we must be independent, able to completely care for ourselves, able to provide for ourselves, able to protect ourselves. We live in this world thinking that we are in control of our own destiny, like the world is but my playground and I can go wherever I want wherever I please. But that's not what Scripture teaches. I'm not the master of my fate. I'm not the captain of my soul. I'm the instrument. I'm not the one wielding the instrument. I'm the sword, not the knight. I'm the pen, not the author. The question Paul is inviting us to consider in the text is, whom do we obey? Whom do we serve? Which knight is wielding the sword? Which author is dictating the patterns of ink that spill out onto the page? To put it another way, if I were to take a coin and flip it into the air, it's going to land in one of two ways. It will either be a heads or it will be a tails. There's no other option. There's no middle ground. There's no gray area. Either we are the Lord's or we aren't. We are slaves, but to whom? The Lord's purposes for his creation are laid out very clearly and plainly in Scripture, that he seeks to care for it, he seeks to provide for all of his people, and he seeks to bring us out of darkness and death into light and into life. God's purpose is for us to live with him forever. We're either seeking to live according to that purpose, or we aren't. Let's think for a little bit here about the good deeds that are done by unbelievers. Can an atheist help someone? Can a Hindu man see a man who has fallen and, and help pick him up again? Can pagans love one another? Can they show kindness? Can they share generously? The answer to those questions on the surface would be yes, Let's dig a little deeper. As they use their hands and their tongues and their feet, are they pointing to Jesus? The answer to that is a resounding no. They may be nice. They may be helpful in the moment, but they are helping to build a house that will not last. They are helping their neighbor to build a community and to build a kingdom that will not last. For when the final trumpet sounds, all of this world and all that she knows will be consumed in fire. And only those whose trust is in Jesus Christ will endure that day. So for all the good that the unbeliever does, it doesn't end up being good at all because it doesn't endure. Because it doesn't point to Christ, it will fail. The work of his hands meets the same end as the works of sin. It all leads to death. 
This is who we once were, slaves to sin, slaves to the sinful passions and desires of our own hearts. These things led not to life, but to death. This is on display in the culture around us in full force. Everything that they call progress is just another step closer to a grave. And then Paul builds on this imagery of slaves as he calls us to obey. I mentioned it a few weeks ago that as Lutherans, there are certain words in Scripture that we just seem to be allergic to sometimes. And the law is the one I mentioned then. Obey would be another one of those allergy-inducing words for us. But it's a word the Lord uses in Holy Scripture, and he actually uses it fairly often. In its original Greek, the word meant to hear under. So it's to hear from the one who is in authority over you, above you. So as children, we obey our parents. Wives obey their husbands. The church obeys Jesus. Jesus obeys his Father. To obey is to receive the word, and then by extension, to live in that word. Yet, that old Adam that is in us still calls us to obey its voice. Our sinful nature still calls us to think his way, to live his way. He convinces us that doing this thing would feel good that thinking this thing about my neighbor will make me feel better today. We were once in subjection to that voice, but no longer. We were once slaves to that sin, but no longer. Those things led only to death, just as Adam and Eve died the very moment that they bit into that forbidden fruit. Death doesn't always look like death, does it? Most unbelievers in the world aren't walking around every day thinking about how dead they are. Sin has convinced them that they are alive and well. Satan has convinced them that they're the wiser for it. But those ways, listening to, obeying that voice, being slaves of sin leads only to one place. To a reunion with Satan in the place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so Paul says, but thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed and having been set free from sin have become slaves of righteousness. The coin has been flipped over. We are no longer slaves of sin. We have been transferred out of the kingdom of death and darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. It's his gift to us. And so we serve. In the past, we would use these instruments like our hands and our mouths and our hearts and our minds. We would use them to serve sin and death. But now, thanks be to God, we use them to serve our Savior, to serve within his kingdom. It's his gift to us. And we do so, Paul says, from the heart. Not because we've made our hearts good, but because he has made our hearts good. He has created new hearts in us. Our hearts can now, as Christians, as his people, be fixed on the hopes and the promises and the purposes of a new master. It's his gift to us. And we do this to the standard of instruction to which we've been committed. Committed by our parents. Committed by the church. Committed by the word of God and the waters of holy baptism. We've been committed, that is, we've been given over, we've been entrusted to a set of teachings. Love your neighbor, make disciples, preach the good news, walk in the Ten Commandments, sing the Psalms. Christ died for you, your sins are forgiven. Christ rose again on the third day, Christ is coming soon. The whole of Scripture is the teaching that you have been given to. And those who are still slaves to sin, they recoil even at the mention of it. And sometimes you can visibly see them recoil whenever you bring up God's word. But that doesn't mean his word is not good. His word is still true. And it's his gift to us. And we do this with freedom. Freedom within our vocations to serve those who are around us. 
Christ isn't a master who is a, a puppeteer or a micromanager plotting out each and every single move that we must make. We don't have to spend each moment that we're awake wondering what it is that God intends for us to do in this moment. And so we have to figure out the secret and hidden will of God. We're free. God, as our master, has placed us in this vast creation and simply called us to serve. You have many neighbors. Some of them may live in your home. Some of them may live in a home next to you. Some of them may live in a home very far away from you. Today, pick a couple of those neighbors and then use the unique skills and interests that the Lord has entrusted to you and serve them. There are literally billions of ways that you could do that today. Pick a few and go do them. Good works are his gift to us as he involves us in the work of his kingdom. We do these things out of love for God, not of love for our neighbor. We do these things because we are slaves and our master has called them good. We don't do it for the reward. Jesus covered that in Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount as well, where he shares with us basically that those who are seeking to do good in order to earn rewards among men, they've received their reward already and they have it in full. There will be nothing further. It's the heart that obeys sin that looks for the reward. Just as Eve was convinced that in her obedience to the desires of her sinful heart, she would receive the reward of wisdom, but instead receive the reward of death. But yours is not that path. Yours is not that master. We have a better master, and he chooses to give us all that is good. Not because we've earned it, not because we deserve it, but because he is good, and he has earned it, and he gives it to us. And that gift is this. You are his, your sins have been paid for, and you are immortal now. Jesus Christ has bestowed on you the gift of life, a life that never ends, life in paradise where our master will be with us and we will praise him, dine with him, and continue to do the good works he has called us to do in caring for his new creation. Now, before I conclude, there's another one of those Lutheran allergic words that showed up in the text that I want to mention, and that would be the word sanctification. Most of the Christian churches around us like to look at sanctification as a process, a progression by which you are slowly becoming better and better, slowly becoming more and more holy, more and more like God. It's not really the way you'll see the scripture use the word, but it is a biblical word and it shows up many times. And it simply means made holy. And that work's already been done. The Apostle Paul will write elsewhere, 1 Corinthians 6, he says, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And then later in Ephesians 5, as Paul is talking about the work of Jesus in loving his bride, the church, he writes, in order that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. And so it is here, so it is now, as we are slaves of God. Paul says in this text, the fruit that you get leads to sanctification and to its end, eternal life. The fruit that you get, not the fruit that you earn, get. Once again, it's a gift, and it's a gift he has given to you. For our master does not lay upon us a heavy burden, but his burden is light, an easy yoke. And so may the Lord fix our hearts to obey his voice, that we may use all of the members of our bodies for work that builds up his kingdom, not the kingdoms of men. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.
we stand for a prayer. In response to the gospel readings for these past two weeks, we will be praying for the Lord to send forth laborers into his harvest. We recently had call day in which the seminaries of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod assigned calls to those who are going into the ministry and receiving their first congregations of service. And in the United States, there are many congregations where they have no pastor at the current time. In other words, they are vacant of not having a full-time pastor to serve them. Here in the Kansas City area, there are four congregations particularly whom we are praying for. Messiah in Independence, St. Paul's in Independence, Ascension in Kansas City, and Holy Trinity in Grandview. And so as a local congregation, we will pray for those congregations that they have a measure of patience as they await our Lord to send forth a laborer in their midst to help those congregations to serve and to thrive in these days. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you have commanded us to pray that you would send forth laborers into your harvest. In your infinite mercy, give us true teachers and ministers of your word who believe that which you have spoken and preach those things that are salutary. We especially pray for all those who have received their first calls into ministry, that you would go before them into their new places of service, preparing the way for them to be able to build relationships with the parishioners and to speak words of repentance and grace. We also pray that you would send forth laborers into those congregations where there is no pastor. We pray with a measure of peace and patience for the congregations in our area. Ascension, Holy Trinity, St. Paul's, and Messiah. That they would not give up hope upon your promise, but rather trust you in the midst of this time in which they are being served by guest preachers. We pray for all those who are studying for the ministry, and especially for our own seminarian, Vincent Otto, as he concludes his vicarage. We pray that you would endow him with wisdom and with the ability to listen and to speak those words which are your words. Heavenly Father, you have given us the church, and the church is governed by your Son, Jesus Christ, who is the good shepherd over all. We pray that you will bring forth laborers who will serve Christ alone during their days. Lord, in your mercy... Almighty God, we pray that you would help all those who are in physical need, those whose bodies are being tested, and who with faith endure physical challenges. We pray especially for Donna Underwood, Jennifer Hours, Dennis Cromley, Roy Litzow, Phyllis Schramm, Peggy Orenberg, Gary Mattis, Susan Velazquez, Elda Denning, Deaconess Sarah, Nancy Carson, Bev Miller, Vanessa Burmeister, Lori Kepsel, Jerry Barant, Patty Ott, Bill McLean, Braden Rohner, Ruth Weinrich, Melvin Steffens, Tracy Redman, Carter Young, and Lucille. We ask that you help them abide, grant them relief from their physical infirmity, and grant them joyfulness even with their infirmity. Lord, in your mercy. 
We thank you for the blessing and gift of holy marriage. And we pray for all married couples. that They would abide in you, daily trusting in you, that their household may have you as the leader. We pray, O Lord, for husbands and wives for a measure of patience and affection towards one another. We pray for those who are engaged, that they are mindful of your ways in approaching marriage and seeking your grace and help. We pray for all those who are married this weekend, especially for Noah DeCombs and Haley McCommon. We ask that in their married life together, they would trust in you and that they would serve and love one another all their days. Lord, in your mercy, Lord Jesus Christ, you have brought us out of darkness and into light. You have rescued us from our previous days. We thank you for being patient with us, even during seasons in which we may have used these bodies and these words in ways that did not bring honor to you. But you have brought us out of the slavery to sin, and you have taught us to take off the old self and put on the new. We thank you that you do good works through us, that you encourage through our words, and through our works of mercy, others are blessed, and that for eternity. We would ask that you lead our congregation, that all that we do may glorify Jesus Christ, giving honor to his name, and that the world may be served for eternity through these good works. Into your hands, Jesus, we commend our prayers. Amen. We now continue with the preface. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places Give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin giving him into death, that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of Sabaoth adored, earth with full acclaim, shout the glory of your name. Sing Hosanna in the highest, sing Hosanna to the Lord. Truly blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We pray as he has taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, 
forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
we stand. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in body and soul until life everlasting. Depart in peace. Now let your servant depart in heavenly peace. I have seen the glory, your alien grace. Like to lead the Gentiles, your holy hill. Glory of your people. In Israel. All glory to the Father, glory to the Son, glory to the Spirit, for three as in the beginning is now shall forever. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming, we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you peace. Amen.
In my announcements today, I want to recognize that with July beginning soon, some of you haven't yet picked up your portals of prayer that cover the months of July, August, and September. So those are out on the table in the narthex as a devotional tool for you all. Uh, we want to welcome a brand new member to our congregation today. His name is Stephen Canaday. He lives here in Lee Summit. And Stephen is the son of Janeth Canaday, who's already a member here. Uh, this week, I'm going to be teaching a Bible class on Wednesday evening. I'm helping the congregation to read through the catechism again. So our topic on Wednesday will be baptism, and we'll talk about those reasons why we baptize infant children, as well as people of all age. And I, I've got one more. I do have one more. You may not be aware of this, but uh, this is the anniversary of Pastor Andrew's ordination into the ministry. Uh, he's celebrating 10 years of serving as a pastor in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. The first five years, he was at St. John's Lutheran Church in Stewartville, Minnesota, which is right outside of, it's where the Mayo Clinic is. The city of Rochester. Rochester, thank you very much, yeah. So he served there for five years, then we extended a call, and he served with us for five years. And so uh, we had a little cake for him during the Bible class time, and so we're thankful for God calling him as a laborer into the harvest and all that we are able to learn through his preaching, and his teaching. So, onward to you and your announcements. All right. I just have Vacation Bible School to share with you all that begins this evening at 5 o'clock. You're welcome to join us. We'll be having tonight's hamburgers and hot dogs off the grill, so you're welcome for that. After dinner, we'll do a study on the Lord's Prayer together. So, Sunday through Thursday, everyone in the congregation is welcome. If you haven't signed up and want to come, there is a sign-up sheet on the table in the narthex. Just write your name, circle the days of the week you can come. We'll get enough food for everyone. Any announcements from anyone else this morning? Go in peace and serve the Lord.